Uh, if I can turn to Jeremiah real quick. Um, Jeremiah 21, where we'll start, I just found this phrase, a saying, I guess you can say. It's only found in Jeremiah, but uh, in, it intrigued me, so I, uh, I looked into it a little bit more of what it means and where it kind of led me. So, uh, 21.8 says, To this people you shall say, Thus says Yahweh, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. And I'm reading out of the web version, so if there's some different words or, or saying says something different, that's why. But Jeremiah 21:9, He who remains in the city shall die by the sword, and by the famine, and by the famine, and by the pestilence. But he who goes out and passes over the Chaldeans who besiege you, you he shall live, and his life shall be to him for a prey. For I have set my face on this city for evil and not for good, says Yahweh. It shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. The phrase or the saying is, his life shall be to him for a prey. Because that's just an interesting way of putting something. I mean, obviously it, it denotes that someone's going to live. But when you say you add that prey part on the end of it, it, uh, it puts a different meaning behind it. Because what it kind of means is that you took something that wasn't really yours, that you seized it that it's like a spoil, a bounty, but you seized upon it. And it wasn't really quite yours to get, but you're receiving it um, and should be joyful for it. Like anybody would be joyful for some kind of bounty of war or, uh, or finding something, especially your life. That, that's pretty nice to, to find that, um, to rejoice in that. Uh, and this is used again in, in Jeremiah 38, same, um, same way he's talking about taken over, or the Chaldeans coming to uh, Jerusalem. And uh, 38 two, you can turn there real quick if, if you want. But thus says Yahweh, he who remains in the city shall die by the sword, by the famine, by the pestilence. But he who goes out forth to the Chaldeans shall live, and his life shall be to him for a prey, and he shall live. Thus says Yahweh, this city shall surely be given into the hand of the army of king of Babylon, and he shall take it. That's how it's used again. Um, the next two examples of it in Jeremiah, uh, he's talking about certain people. And we can turn to Jeremiah 39 real quick, this next chapter. And he's talking about Abimelech. Um, and Abimelech is an Ethiopian, and he helped Jeremiah. Uh, he pulled him out of the pit. He sought the king uh, at the time to, you know, get Jeremiah out of it. And uh, he helps Jeremiah. He believes in God, and he trusts in God. But Jeremiah 39, 15 it says, Now the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the guard, saying, Go and speak to Abimelech, the Ethiopian, saying, Thus says Yahweh of armies, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring my words on, on the city for evil and not for good, and they shall be accomplished before you in that day. But I will deliver you in that day, says Yahweh, and you shall not be given into the hand of men of whom you are afraid. For I will surely save you, and you shall not fall by the sword, but your life shall be a prey for you, because you have put your trust in me, says Yahweh. So you see here, Abimelech has done something good, and he trusts God, and God delivers him. It's this giving of life is a deliverance that God is providing for people. Um, but notice, even in all these uh, instances that he used it, he says, I'm coming to the city. For evil, not for good. It's going to happen whether you like it or not. And uh, as we'll get into the next example here, God still brings that, but he delivers it. That brings that wrath, that sorrow that we seem as sorrow. He brings that still to the city, but he delivers us from it. It's where not, we're always delivered. We're not exempt from that, um, from part, not partaking, but uh, a being part, witnessing, let me put it that way, of that sorrow. Uh, and Jeremiah 45, real quick, starting in verse 1, short chapter. The word of Jeremiah the prophet spoke to Baruch, the son of Neriah, 
when he wrote these words in a book at the mouth of Jeremiah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, Josiah, king of Judah, saying, and Baruch is basically um, Jeremiah's scribe. He's writing down everything Jeremiah said. Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, to you, Baruch, you did say, woe is me now, for Yahweh has added sorrow to my pain, and I am weary with my groaning, and I find no rest. Thus shall you tell him, thus says Yahweh, Behold, that which I have built I will break down, and that which I have planted I will pluck up. And in this whole land, seek you, things, seek you great things for yourself, don't seek them. For behold, I will bring evil on all flesh, says Yahweh. But your life I will give to you for a prey, and all places where you go. So you have Baruch here, and he's travailing at this sorrow, this stuff that is coming on Israel. And it seems like he's also kind of like, hey, when am I going to get something good here too? Because I've been hanging out with Jeremiah, and he hasn't been treated so well. Uh, and I'm kind of, you know, under, under fire here too. Because in verse 45, he says, seek great, great things for yourself. Don't seek them. He says, your life, that's what you get. You're going to be delivered from this. You're not completely exempt from this. You're not excluded. You still have to go through the sorrow of your country being overtaken by the Chaldeans. Um, and, and your life is mine. I'm giving it to you. I'm letting you have it. It's a spoil. It's yours to have, or it's mine to give to you. But Baruch is, you know, is obviously like, what's going to happen? When is uh, this all going to end? And it's kind of like that for us. It's constant sorrow constant uh just life in general brings you stuff there there are times of enjoyment but it's almost sometimes a struggle every day when we hit those things it's one thing after another sometimes um and i don't mean to paint a gleam uh, a bad picture or anything but that's because god he still has us walking through those things but he delivers us at the end we're not excluded from him not totally exempt from them but he delivers us in the end um, let's go to uh, Psalms 91. So Psalms 91 starts with, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High God shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, and will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. He shall, he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Now he says he's going to deliver him from the snare of the fowler. He still got caught in the snare. You hear that same kind of thing. But God delivers him out of that snare. He delivers him from the hand of the fowler. Like he said with Abimelech, I'm going to save you from man who you're afraid of. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. He, his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. You see, you hear the terror at night. You still have to go through night. You still have to go through the day and see the things that are going on. But... He's your shield. He's your buckler. Nor for the pestilence that walketh in the darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh to thee. Now, these are things that you are physically seeing, these, things, these people falling to your right and your left. But nothing's going to come to you. You're still going to have to endure these things, walk through these things and see these things. But I will deliver. Only with thine eyes, shall thou, uh, thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. You can also see through this whole thing the references to Christ uh, as it goes through. They shall bear thee up... In their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Doesn't say you don't have to step over stones. Doesn't say you don't have to climb mountains. It says you're not going to dash your foot against the stones. You're going to have to go through things. 
Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder. You still have to face the lion and the adder, but you're going to tread them in the long run. The young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him. I will show him my salvation, my deliverance. And with that long life, he satisfies. Um, and you see all throughout there, God doesn't exempt you from the sorrow, from the pain, from struggles in life that we just have. Normal struggles, I'm not trying to get too, too heady or, or deep or anything. But he rewards you once again. He delivers you with a long life and salvation, with deliverance. Christ, I mean, this is all about Christ, and we all know what he had suffered, what he went through. He was not even exempt from pain and suffering for us. So, um, but we have that long life, like he says, a long life. And we have a life here, obviously, but we also know true life, which is after Christ returns. Jesus Christ, the life. We have that to look forward to, and we have that as a prey, as a spoil, really. Something that wasn't ours, that we seized a hold of. We saw an opportunity, we saw the stones, and we climbed up them. We saw the adder, we saw the, the lion, we beat them up, we trampled them, and we took a hold. We seized upon our prey, that life, which is Christ. Um, now let's go to Baruch again, just to... Uh, I'll just read a verse real quick that seek ye great things for yourself. Don't seek them. That's what he tells Baruch. Don't seek the great things for yourself. Um, because it's your life that is your reward. It's the life that you get. Turn to Psalms 90 now, the page. Uh, this is written by Moses, and it kind of is a little bit dreary and all, a little uh, not a positive outlook till the end there. But it's what to do with the life that we have, with this life, that this physical life, not this next one. We know what we're going to do there, be kings and priests, or we have a, a hint of what we will do. But in Psalms 90, I'll start at the beginning. It says, A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever there hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and what that means is basically you turn him back to dust. It doesn't mean God, you know, destroys him. It's, that's our physicality. That's what we do is we end up turning back to dust. And sayest, return ye children of men back to dust. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday and as in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as, a, as asleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up, and in the evening it is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed by thine anger and by thy wrath we are troubled. For thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Even if we have ten extra years onto our life, there's still labor and sorrow. Like he says, Who knoweth the power of thine anger, even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts to, unto wisdom. So what do we do with that life? Moses says right here, be humble. He says, uh, number our days. Remember that we are but dust. And that we are all um, should be partakers of God's wrath, but we have Christ's mercy to, uh, to save us there. And to seek that wisdom, which is Jesus Christ. Return, return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and even the years wherein we have seen evil. 
Let thy work appear unto thy servants and thy glory unto their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou. Now I find this a little bit interesting because uh, Moses just went on about how we're nothing but dust and how we just return to it. But then he says at the end, establish our hands, establish what we do to establish our work. And we know that we can't establish anything unless it is on a foundation on Christ. And like he says in 16, let thy work appear unto thy servants and thy glory unto their children. We need to take a hold of that work, that work that he set before us to do. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of God. That's what we're establishing. That's the work we should try to accomplish, to do. Because that's the only work that endures. We can't establish anything else that lasts forever. But he wants the work of our hands to be established. We have to continue to establish God's word. Establish that first and foremost. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Let your work be for God. Establish righteousness, mercy, love, faith, hope. And I'm sure there's a ton of other words you can, uh, you can do to describe God and, and his uh, greatness. 1 Corinthians 3.10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon his foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare, because it shall be re revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work, and what sort it is. It is. It is. Sort it is. Yeah, there we go. If any man's work... Abide, which is which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. You see what's going on here. God is trying what people are building. He's looking at the works of everybody's hand, and he's trying them by fire. And the fire will burn whatever is not established, whatever God has not established himself which would be the works of God, God's works, his holiness, his mercy. Sixteen, know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Just like Moses said, number your days. Seek out wisdom. Seek out God's wisdom. Seek the wisdom here. Don't seek the glory out there. Establish God's work. Uh, another building, uh, you know, parable, uh, Luke 6. Luke 6, uh, 646. And why call ye me Lord, Lord? And do not the things which I say. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you who he is like. He is like a man which built a house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. Notice he doesn't just find a place where rocks are. He has to dig deep. He has to put forth effort. 
to be delivered. He has to dig deep and build the house and lay the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon the rock. Just like I said, he doesn't exempt you from noticing or, or being aware of these sorrows. There's still a flood that comes. You're just delivered out of this flood. You're safe from this flood. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a, an house upon the earth, against which the stream did vehemently beat, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of the house was great. And this gentleman, this guy, didn't build his house on Christ, like we said, on the works, on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And, and uh, the house was great. The ruin was great. Just like Jerusalem fell, that ruin was great. John eleven twenty five 25 says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will still live, even if he dies. Whosoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? We've been given a new life. We've been given a foundation to live on and to work on and to establish something great for God. He's going to try it. He's going to push it. And, uh, and test us to see how well we do. Uh, so we have this new life, something that wasn't ours, something that was given to us. We took a hold, we seized upon it, we did work for it. All through the grace of God. Once again, it was a gift. It's not something that was just given to us. So we need to take hold of that life, believe in it. Just like he says to uh, Martha here, do you believe this? <clears throat> 